With its unassuming cast of teenage characters and unique art design, you could be forgiven for not realising just how brutal and sadistic the overall story of the Danganronpa universe is. However, as the tale of Hope's Peak Academy unfolds, the series becomes nuanced and complex in exploring themes of hope, despair, and human nature in a refreshing and original way. Taking advantage of its inconspicuous aesthetic, Danganronpa showcases its dark and violent story in a wide variety of ways, from the absurd and minimalist displays of gore in the first season, to the unprecedented brutality and bloodshed that runs rampant throughout both halves of Danganronpa 3. There's a lot of symbolism to be found in the stylistic choices used for the depiction of violence in both the original Danganronpa and Danganronpa 3, and there's not really a lot of consistency between the two. So let's unpack them and explore the ways each series is affected by these choices. Surprisingly, the presence of blood in Danganronpa the animation is pretty modest compared to a wide variety of contemporary anime, which is especially unconventional given how intrinsic violence is to the overall plot. For the students trapped within the killing game, the mere sight of blood becomes analogous with death. Naturally, each murder victim is found covered in blood, but interestingly enough, each character who bleeds or touches blood ultimately dies as well. This cause and effect relationship between blood and death is most definitely a deliberate one, even outside the murders and punishments. And to illustrate this, we only need to compare the fates of two important characters, Hifumi Yamada and Aoi Asahina. Yamada douses himself in blood from the infirmary to appear as though he had been attacked, only to be attacked and killed for real shortly after. Asahina, on the other hand, is directly wounded by scissors without the viewer seeing so much as a drop of blood, and she ultimately survives to the end. As a result, blood isn't just a simple tool to signify damage like in other anime. In Danganronpa, touching blood effectively marks a character for death. This is all the more relevant when comparing just how scarce blood is in Danganronpa, even after a murder or punishment, versus other anime with similar themes. It is this relative realism that makes the crime scenes all the more chilling, presenting a sober reminder that Danganronpa is a story about teenagers killing each other. But the understated and carefully deliberate depiction of blood in Danganronpa 1 is to say nothing of its bizarre coloration and the implications that come with it. In what undoubtedly began as a clever method of in-game censorship to keep the age rating low, almost all the blood in Danganronpa 1 is an iconic neon pink. This change in colour is consistent with the other comical yet sinister art design found within the game, such as the farcically large bolts on the steel plating, and despite being done to avoid censorship, the blood being pink has resulted in one of the most iconic and thematically significant aspects of the series as a whole. In making the blood pink, the series makes a number of powerful statements about the psychological states of those participating in the killing game. Since the beginning, the students have been primed by Monokuma to view their ordeal as a game, signified by the voting, slot machine, and punishment animation. This subconsciously encourages them to dissociate with the violence they witness, and in this way the pink blood signifies a sort of group hallucination. It becomes a way for the participants to dehumanise their potential targets, viewing them as objectives in a larger game rather than other human lives. This is exemplified in the scene where Togami discovers the aftermath of Hope's Peak's first killing game, with the leftover carnage retaining its normal red colour. This shows there is a relationship between how immediate the bloodshed is, and how readily the students' psyches need to manage stress and anxiety by perceiving the blood as pink. In order to deal with the stresses of what they have seen, the characters must distance themselves from the full extent of the horror they are subject to, and this manifests in an aberrant perception of reality. Ultimately, what is most harrowing in Danganronpa 1 is the blood is tantamount to murder and murder to betrayal. In order for someone to die in the closed circle of Hope's Peak, one member of the group necessarily betrays the other in an attempt for personal gain. It is a persistent and grim reminder that in this school life of mutual killings is every man for himself. Danganronpa 3's despair arc is quick to abandon these thematic motifs from the original series. This is slightly jarring when initially comparing the two, as Despair's aesthetic relationship with blood and violence takes time to develop again after a shaky start. Perhaps the best example of this is that the first drop of blood we see in the Despair arc is Teru Teru suffering a blood nose from being sexually aroused. And if this seems decidedly tame compared to some of the brutality we see in the first season, that's because it is. 
The first few episodes of the Despair arc depict a normal world, one devoid of the series' famous aura of despair, and as such, blood is an everyday occurrence that lacks any real narrative significance. It's incidental and unremarkable, just like real life, at least to begin with. And while this could be seen as tactless and not deeply considered on the surface, this is certainly not the case. It simply sets the scene for later, important juxtaposition. Then, after the tense off-screen deaths of Natsumi and Sato successfully reinforce that the absence of visible violence can be just as terrifying as its presence, the despair arc completely sheds any sense of subtlety or normalcy in its depiction of violence and gore. The Despair arc chronicles the brutal transition from the regular world we inhabit to a world that is brought to its knees by despair. This is characterised by a significant amount of death and utilises visceral scenes such as the student council killing game in order to demonstrate that in a world of despair, violence doesn't have any underlying meaning or cause. While this may appear as the despair arc attributing no artistic significance to the use of blood, the significance comes from just how much blood there is compared to the deaths of the first season, as well as just how violently the victims are killed and how little prompting it takes to make someone kill. Blood is shed in the latter half of the despair arc when the perpetrator has succumbed fully to despair, opting to solve problems or disputes with as much suffering and brutality as possible. In this way, the shedding of a victim's blood is the attacker shedding the last of their civility and compassion as a person. This maliciousness is endemic to killing in the name of despair. So much so that series antagonist Junko and Ashima displays it with just how ruthless and drawn out her killing of Chiaki Nanami was, brutally killing the 77th class's symbol of hope in order to maximise their eventual despair. The philosophy behind the violence in the despair arc is simply that no one person's life truly matters in the new world, and it is demonstrated by how cavalierly many characters both unimportant and crucial are injured, tortured and killed, with none of the premeditation or rationale that accompanied the murders of the first season. Where the depiction of violence between Danganronpa 1 and the despair arc changed significantly to reflect the different worlds the characters inhabited, the Despair arc instead heavily influenced the indiscriminate ultraviolence of the Future arc. Danganronpa 3's second half, the Future arc, takes place in a world where despair is the new normal. It's everywhere, in the OP, in the first episode, and even deep within the psyches of all the characters. But most notably about the Future arc is that the coloration of the abundant blood has changed from the series standard pink in favour of a realistic and unflinching crimson. The members of the Future Foundation are intimately aware of just how harsh their new reality is due to living within it for so long. Psychologically, the characters have reached a point where they are simply unable to suppress or ignore the brutality they've witnessed since the world fell. This is of course assuming the change in colour wasn't just for one stupid gag. They wouldn't do that, would they? What makes the events of the Future Arc all the more devastating is that while the Future Foundation may fight against despair, they are not in fact a force of hope. Their ranks are filled with individuals who seem to have no qualms about using extreme violence against their supposed allies in order to further their own ambitions, such as Munakata demanding that Nagi commit suicide in the name of hope, or Sakakura assaulting anyone who interrupts him, and in some cases they're prepared to kill for little more than a perceived inconvenience. This familiarity with violence and lack of hesitation to commit it is made bare by the way that the Future Foundation so readily fight one another. Taking the final killing game as an opportunity to air personal grudges and enact power struggles instead of finding a solution together. Many of them opt for violence simply to communicate. Another important detail to note is that many characters in the future arc seem to have incredible resistance to physical injury and pain, most notably Sakakura and Tengan. Both of these characters suffer injuries that within the context of Danganronpa 1 would be no less than a cause of immediate death, and despite that, these mortal injuries do nothing to hinder Tengan's ability to offer expository dialogue or Sakakura's ability to skulk around as Munakata's muscle. Even Munakata himself isn't exempt from this, having lost an eye in his fight against Tengan. The pain of this injury barely seems to affect him even before injecting the drug, and does nothing to impair his fighting ability or hand-eye coordination at all. 
The extreme resilience to injury is pretty clearly to propel the plot and maximise drama, but this bizarre phenomenon actually suggests a fair bit about the conditions that the Future Foundation have been forced to adapt to, as well as how little they can actually afford to have egregious violence hinder them in their attempts to repair their desolate and ruined world. There isn't any obvious artistic meaning behind the way blood and gore is used aesthetically in the future arc, at least not as obviously as Danganronpa 1. However, the constant and ruthless infighting among its principal characters helps to paint a clear picture about the relationship between the Plague of Despair and the horrendous violence committed by people who aren't necessarily traditionally evil. While the artistic philosophy and narrative significance does change for each entry in the Danganronpa series, one thing is for certain. It is, and always will be, a bloody and violent series.